Yesterday was the first iteration of uh, Deep River preaching and the Holy Spirit, and we really engaged um, with what has been called the Third Testament, as the spirituals, the genre of the spirituals as expressions of the Spirit that could be helpful to us in the ministry of preaching. And today, I want to deal with uh, not the Third Testament, but the New Testament, um, particularly Acts 2, um, under the umbrella of preaching and Pentecost, uh, preaching and Pentecost. But as we begin, you know we got to (laughs) sing. But playing off of what we had yesterday morning. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Maranatha, come, Lord, come, come, Lord, come, come, Lord, come, come. Lord, come. come We ask that you would come, O God, and be our teacher in this classroom, make it an upper room, this morning, for your praise and glory, now and forever, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. During, so preaching in Pentecost, during my first year in seminary on a particular weekday in Princeton Seminary's Miller Chapel, essentially a Presbyterian meeting house built for worship in 1834. The preacher spoke of the spirit as if she was his best friend and closest confidant. This senior class student began to preach And as he proclaimed, he interjected the phrase, help me, Holy Ghost. One time, two times, three times, and then I lost count of how many times he said, help me, Holy Ghost. And so maybe he was praying for himself in that moment because he realized that the sermon wasn't going over too well. (laughs) Maybe he thought that if he said Holy Ghost ten times, that would make his sermon more spirit-filled and cause us to actually pay more attention to a sermon. But saying Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit does not guarantee that one is in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, or bearing the fruit of the Spirit. As I said yesterday, everybody talking about the Spirit ain't necessarily got the Spirit. So sitting in holy shock that morning, we began to silently affirm this preacher's prayer and say our own version of it. (laughs) Help him, Holy Ghost. (laughs) Help him and that sermon. (laughs) Or perhaps we said our own, help me, Holy Ghost. (laughs) Meaning help me endure what is being said. So as he continued, it became increasingly clearer that something was sorely wrong, and our shock reached its unforgettable peak when the preacher announced to us literally and said, you won't praise God because you're just mean. It didn't seem to occur to him that maybe meanness was not the reason we didn't praise God but rather because the sermon was a smelly linguistic version of some mean cow manure. 
He had unknowingly performed rhetorical terrorism and dropped a homiletical weapon of mass destruction, which left many hearers thinking the spirit was all about death rather than life. I don't think the Holy Ghost answered his prayer during his sermon on that day, but our prayer was finally answered and we were helped when he finished his sermon and sat down. <laughs> this does not mean that we fully understood what happened that morning. Indeed, some of us who were there are still searching for the black box from that sermon to see what actually went wrong on that morning in Miller Chapel. There's nothing wrong with saying, help me, Holy Ghost. But do we really understand to whom and for what we are pleading? The Holy Spirit is both a concealed and a revealed mystery, a wind that hovered over the face of the waters at creation, a wind that blows where it wills and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know from where it comes or where it goes. Even on the day of Pentecost, suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. Wind, fire, the Hebrew word for spirit, ruach, means wind or breath. It is feminine. The Greek word pneuma for spirit is neuter. We grasp for language to talk about the spirit of God. He, she, it. Some thingify the spirit and can't make sense of this third person of the Trinity who is sometimes perceived as the stepchild in the divine family. Yet the Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, the one in whom, according to theologian Jurgen Moltmann, the one in whom our life wakes up. And so the Holy Spirit is the one in whom our preaching wakes up. Without God's breath, the Spirit, humanity would not exist. Therefore, neither would preaching. But with the Spirit, our preaching can hashtag stay woke. So in his Lyman Beecher lectures, published as the Holy Spirit in preaching, James Forbes states, the preaching event itself is a living, breathing, flesh and blood expression of the theology of the Holy Spirit. Yet there has been a paucity of substantive homiletical literature on the Holy Spirit, although theologically, the Spirit is the power of the word, the power of proclamation. With this in mind, this, this lecture is an attempt to foreground pneumatological thinking for homiletics, despite the fact it is always a precarious situation to speak about a wind that blows where it wills. Today I will explore the wondrous fiery wind experienced on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. Liturgically, Christians celebrate Pentecost as an end of the Easter season at 50 days, linking the resurrection and ascension of Christ with the sending of the Holy Spirit. Historically, Pentecost is related to the Jewish harvest festival of Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks. It commemorated the giving of the law at Sinai, but also celebrated harvesting of wheat. During this festival, people could bring their first fruits to the temple as an offering. And so using this historical lens, one might then say that Pentecost is the human experience of the first fruits of the Spirit or the communion of the Holy Spirit with the human spirit. The liturgical or historical significance of Pentecost is not unimportant. But this lecture is not about preaching on Pentecost as a special day in the liturgical calendar, nor is it about Pentecostalism as a Christian movement per se, nor about Pentecostal preaching within certain contexts. This lecture aims to utilize the day of Pentecost as a lens through which to teach and learn about the gift of the Spirit in relation to speaking and hearing the gospel in context. In other words, one may refer to this as a constructive homiletical reading of the day of Pentecost while seeking to answer this particular question. And the question is, what does the day of Pentecost and the work of the Spirit on that day in particular reveal to us about preaching and proclamation more broadly. Now, I know we're in a seminary and I know all of you have the word in your heart, <laughs> but this story of the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, I'm gonna read a portion of it for our memory and our, and our imagination today. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. 
And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own native languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. Oh, Lord, send the power just now. And baptize everyone. So first, these homiletical reflections through Pentecost. First, the gift of speaking. At Pentecost, what is revealed is that even the coming of the Spirit on this day is a gift. Jesus reminded the disciples of the promise of the Father and told them to wait for it. They had to wait to be baptized in the Spirit because the descent of the Spirit is a gift, not something of their own creation. This is further emphasized when Luke writes, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound. The sound came. The Spirit came on divine volition, reminding us that the Spirit is God's gift to us. Divine agency is the prelude to powerful human agency as it relates to being effective Christian preachers in the world. Because the disciples will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, as we hear in chapter 1, the prelude of God's action takes priority in preaching when framed pneumatologically. So preaching is first about God, God's Spirit, God's power, God's Word. If God doesn't speak, we have nothing to say. Amen. And as one writer put it, blessed is the man who, having nothing to say, abstains from giving us wordy evidence of the fact. <laughs> Preachers, sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all. Just sit down. <laughs> but at Pentecost, when the Spirit came, we hear that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The Spirit gives the people the ability to speak in other languages. As Will Willimon writes, the first gift of the Spirit is the gift of speech. The gift of speech in different languages, the first fruit of the Spirit, the gift of proclamation. As shown throughout the biblical witness, word and spirit are creatively collaborative. Pentecost is another example of this and demonstrates how the Spirit enables multilingual speech. The gift of speech Proclamation is a gift of the Spirit. The object of study for homiletics, the spoken word, would be non-existent and most definitely impotent without the Spirit's work through our mouths and bodies. So the proclaimed gospel is not something of our own creation. The gift of proclamation comes from a word outside and beyond us that comes to and through us and fills us to speak from our particular selves, but not about ourselves. This pneumatic speech is for something and someone greater than us, yet it is expressed in and through distinct cultural ways. It is in us and flows through us, but it is given to us by the Spirit a gift from God. The sound came. 
Tongues of fire rested on each of them and such that others might be ignited. Holy fire comes down in order that fire may rise back up through inspired speech. Yet again, fire is not a human creation. It is a warm, illuminating gift, a gift of speech, of tongues, of languages that comes with a purpose to be understood. So that brings me to the gift of hearing and understanding. The gift of speech is, is not given in order not to be understood. Proclaimers preach in order to be heard and hopefully understood. Now, let me just say that there are times that people will, will not get what you say. I still remember at the back door of Duke Chapel greeting people as they leave, someone was on the other side, the other door, and they were leaving. And as they were walking out, they were like, you lost me, you lost me, literally, <laughs> right? And there was another man, one day, one sermon I had preached on, um, on 1 Corinthians and Moria, where it talks about uh, foolishness, morons, and this whole thing, and donkeys, and foolishness. And, and this man, he was a visitor, he was leaving. And I, I'm usually shaking hands. And this guy put his hands behind his back. And he says, my God's not a donkey. And he walked out just like that. So sometimes we won't be understood. Right? People will not understand what we say. They may hear us, but they don't understand. Right? And so I think there's that reality. So as the Pentecost unfolds, though another, this other gift is, is obvious in this passage, the gift of hearing in one's own language. The gift of ecstatic speech at Pentecost is traditionally hide up, highlighted, especially in the, the context in which I grew up, classical Pentecostal settings, in which speaking in tongues is taught to be the initial evidence of baptism in the Spirit. But what's also stressed in this scriptural account is how others understand what is being spoken. When disciples are filled with the Spirit and speak in other languages as the Spirit enables them to do so, Jews from every nation under heaven become bewildered and amazed because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. The miracle is not the physical ability of hearing, but it is the understanding of what is being proclaimed despite the different culture of the proclaimers. And due to their understanding, they have to ask, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? They can't believe it. The proclaimers were not of the same ethnicity and culture, yet they heard and understood. The lens of Pentecost urges one to seek understanding, not just mere hearing. This suggests that a turn to the spirit in homiletics is a turn to the speaker, but also to the listener. Understanding is not just as important, uh, is just as important as speaking, and both are gifts of the Spirit at Pentecost. The gospel you proclaim may be an exciting wedding of, of ecstasy and exegesis, but do the hearers understand what you're saying? Right? In, our, in our day, we have to be mindful of, as teachers and educators, of the different learning styles of people. And this is true. There are different listening styles. There's different hearing styles. I, I, even in the context of the, the church I grew up in, Greater Miami Church of God in South Florida, Miami, Florida, I remember um, I was, as a high schooler, became a, I was thrust into becoming a, a worship leader, a song leader. And my accompanist was a pianist, uh, Sister Timms, who was in her 80s. And uh, Sister Timms, and at the time of when, you know, you have an altar call, what's called an altar call, people are coming to, music is being played, people come forward for prayer. It's not necessarily for salvation, but healing, you know, needs, prayers of the people, really. And, and so there was one particular Sunday morning, and that's at the end of the service, and um, Sister Tim's is playing, I'm singing as people are praying, and, and, um, and I remember what we were singing, but I remember there was a Sister Sheila in the church. And you know, as a teenager, you, 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 you have names for different people, but, but <laughs> Sister Sheila, though, she had a particular way of shouting. And at the altar that Sunday morning, Sister Sheila started doing her thing. <laughs> and I'll never forget, because 
Sister Tim's leaned over to me because we had taken a break. She, she leaned over to me in the moment and she said, she must think God is deaf. <laughs> right? But, but my point is, people come to God in different ways, right? Sometimes it is the shout, but sometimes it's the silence, right? Sometimes it's the fire, and sometimes it's the cool, warm breeze, or the cool, warm breeze. That's an oxymoron, but that's the spirit for you. <laughs> and, and, and so we paying attention. Do peers understand what we're saying with all of the diversity of listeners and styles. So there are two other times in this particular passage where this gift of understanding is emphasized actually, verse eight and 11. And in one instance, the hearers ask, and how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? That they hear them speaking in their own languages is a gift, is the gift. Because without understanding, the proclamation may just be a noisy gong, clanging cymbal, or pure white noise. But the Spirit assures that there are receptive ears to the word proclaimed, regardless of the cultural makeup of, of the hearers. For preaching to be effective, there needs to be hearers, and the Spirit provides this gift. The audience for the gospel is not void of, but filled with the Spirit as well. It's a communal atmosphere. When we're talking about preaching in the spirit, it's not just the preacher we're talking about, but also the congregation and the community. So if the spirit only moves in the pulpit, then the preaching event will not be what God desires it to be for the entire community. The spirit helps us take listeners seriously and to view their role in the preaching event as significant. Proclamation entails both speakers and listeners. The gospel needs a proclaimer and a recipient of the word, which is why Evans Crawford in his book, The Hum, talks about participant proclamation. The book of Romans is often quoted, and how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? But what Pentecost raises is, and, how, and why would you proclaim him if there's no one to hear? This is not to present a romantic ideal of hearers because in Acts, though others may have heard, they did not always understand. I mean, some were amazed for sure, but others sneered and they thought they were on a college campus because they said they are filled with new wine. <laughs> In preaching, remember, as I said yesterday, there is always the cheers and the jeers. And as Jesus revealed in the Gospel of Luke, those that initially praise him are the same ones that are filled with rage in the end and want to push him off a cliff. So after a Sunday morning service, uh, a, a little boy approached uh, the pastor, a pastor and, who had preached that morning. And when he, he reached the pastor, he opened his little hands, revealing some money he had for the pastor. And, and, and the pastor asked, why are you giving me money? And the, and the little, little boy said, my dad said you were one of the poorest preachers he's ever heard. <laughs> Some will be amazed and others will be enraged at the same sermon. This is true at Pentecost, right? There was ecstasy, um, but also comprehensibility or, or what John Levison, the New Testament scholar calls sober intoxication. The intoxication comes via inspiration and the infilling of the spirit that empowers both human speech and understanding. One is enabled to hear the word in one's own language, but the hearer does not own the word granted, nor is the ability to hear and understand owned by the listener. Understanding is given, gifted to us in the moment of proclamation because humans do not have the resources to manufacture it. Therefore, without a giver of life, we would not receive the gift of understanding. As Nora Tubbs Tisdale writes, revelation in preaching can never be earned or deserved or attained by our own human striving. It is always a gift of a God who chooses in freedom to reveal God's self to us, to condescend to our captus, our comprehension. And that reminds me what Howard Thurman talks about. 
and saying, and I'm paraphrasing in his Meditations of the Heart, where he basically says that just because you are engaging in a right practice doesn't guarantee the presence, right? We don't control God. And this is true in preaching. So furthermore, understanding is possible because the hearers did not just hear, but they heard in their own native language. That is, in their own cultural tongue. And this suggests that the gift of the word of the gospel is contextualized, revealing a contextual pneumatology of the gospel. The gift of the spirit who brings the word comes to somewhere, some place, some person. The word is never a contextual if it is to be understood and if it is in and of the spirit because the spirit embraces cultures while this pericope also reveals how cultures embrace the spirit. The word must be native to the hearer who stands in a particular culture in order for the gospel to have a hearing. Moreover, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. So place is important signifying that the gift comes to a specific place in time as the spirit facilitates the contextualization of the word. Context is inescapable because one can never escape one's own skin or even one's own native tongue. For the gospel to be the gospel, it has to land somewhere, particular in time and space. In the spirit, the gospel incarnates through human languages such that people hear in their own particular cultural language the universal message about God's power. As with the incarnation via the spirit, God translates the word into human means that we humans may understand and know the gospel in the flesh in particular ways. To speak to a human world, think about it, the word of God or God's sermon had to become human in Christ through the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit is the agent of the incarnation. Therefore, she translates divinity to humanity that the word of God, the gospel, could be spoken and understood in context. And so on that day of Pentecost, the Spirit takes the initiative to provide a contextual, cultural word for each particular person so that the empowered word can be understood. The Spirit engages in the work of translation by translating the word into each native language present such that others may hear about God. The gospel needs to be translated in order that every nation under heaven can understand in its own culture. The word is not monolingual. Amen. Pentecost represents the Spirit's embrace of cultural particularity and context and pro promotes essentially worldwide proclamation. Translation into each language demonstrates a divine care for diverse cultures, ethnicities, and languages. In the spirit, diversity is not a dirty word, but a beautiful one in the light of God. If one has problems with diversity, one has to take it up with the spirit who creates diversity in the first place. As the gospel is born in particular contexts, cultures, languages, and bodies being fully expressed in a material world. Therefore, one might say that the Holy Spirit communes with the human spirit in order to proclaim an effectual and powerful contextual word. Though the notion of gift prioritizes the work of God, God does not deny or erase human investment in the proclamation of the gospel. Pentecost reveals that human speakers and human hearers are needed for God's deeds of power to be known. Pneumatology implies humanity. It implies materiality and the embrace of culture, not the negation of it. The spirit is life for the human spirit, not death. She ignites and enlivens humanity in such a way that the gospel spreads all over the world. Pentecost suggests the flourishing of humankind and not its destruction because, the power, because of the power and gift of the Spirit. And through the translation work of the Spirit, the gospel of God is proclaimed and heard in the vernacular, or what Henry Mitchell calls the mother tongue of the Spirit, in order for the word to be received and heard as pronobis for us, or in our own native language. Now let me say something about the gift of a God-centered community. The cultural particularity of the Spirit's gift 
as shown at Pentecost is not contrary to the universal quality of proclamation. According to Yves Congar, there is the Catholicity of witness. He further says the distinctive aspect of the spirit is that while remaining unique and preserving her identity, she's in every one without causing anyone to lose her originality. This applies to persons, peoples, their culture, their talents. The spirit also makes everyone speak of the marvels of God in their own language. The gift of hearing and understanding in context reveals the common message of the gospel, God, God. I mean, turning to the spirit in homiletics is a turn to the human speaker and hearer, without a doubt, but it is also a turn to God. What the people heard in their native languages was the message about God's deeds of power, not a sermon on seven principles for a happy life. This theocentrism is in fact a gift as it relates to homiletics. Preachers should not have to fret about what to preach because the gift of guidance is given. We are to proclaim God. One stories, illustrations, exegesis, sermon content and delivery should point to God and God's action. When reflecting on the nature of preaching through a pneumatological lens, one realizes that God is essential as subject and object. One is given a gift by God through the spirit, thus one speaks of God. Pentecost privileges God as the universal content of proclamation through particular cultural means. The end is always God, but the means is always particular holding together the creative relationship between particularity and universality. Both are gifts, yet God is primary as central to pneumatic proclamation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once preached one of his sermons that people are bored with the church and the cinema appears to be more interesting than the church because we talk too much about false, trivial human things, he says, and ideas in the church and too little about God. The Pentecostal spirit will not allow us to forget about God. For as Michael Verka says in his great book, God the Spirit, he writes this, through the pouring out of the spirit, God effects a world encompassing, multilingual, poly-individual testimony to God's self. In this way, God attests to God's self in a process that unites people in a way that causes them both wonderment and fear. Though there is a diverse community, there is unity around the presence of God. Pentecost is a community building festival, but it is a distinct community in which God is the center. Cultural specificity is important as noted already, but in the spirit, it is decentered. God dethrones cultural or ethnic hegemony at Pentecost. But it is also necessary to say that cultural identity in particularity is not erased or obliterated either. Cultural identity is fully present, fully inspirited, yet the spirit leads proclaimers to speak about and praise God and not the self. The heart of the gospel is God regardless of the context. The spirit doesn't allow us to suffer amnesia on this point, whether in theory or practice. At the same time, the gift of a word from God about God occurs within and creates a distinct community. Preaching that takes the spirit seriously must not hide behind or promote God as a way to homogenize the community, right? That's, that's using historically divinity right? And, and, and at the neglect of, of humanity. I, I can say God and we can, over, we can be um, uh, overly Christian, right? And still act demonically, right? And so we, historically we see people who use the category of God for self-protection and, and for power and, and for domination. So it's not, we have to be careful not to promote God as a way to homogenize the community. Though God-centered Pentecost reveals the gift of a community 
that represents boundary-breaking realities across culture, ethnicity, race, and language. In the spirit, there is no room for segregation or silos because the spirit works towards integration, collaboration, and mutuality toward the formation of community and dialogue. Through this communal interaction, there can be greater understanding about the fullness of God and even homiletics. And so this formation of a global community through the inbreaking of the spirit breaks humanity out of our proclivity toward homogeneity and moves us to embrace a broad gospel for the ends of the earth. The gift of God opens us to a more hospitable vision in which the spirit is poured out on all flesh for proclamation to the ends of the earth. Any culture anywhere can be a conduit of the spirit. Thus, there is no limit to whom or where the gospel can be preached. Though a word may be contextual in a particular culture, the gospel is never enclosed or trapped within any one culture. The gospel is free and open in the light of an expansive Pentecostal spirit who knows no bounds and creates a diverse human community. Pentecost suggests that the spirit opens us up to the possibility of hospitable relations across cultures as opposed to closed systems and practices that restrain the full scope of the gospel message of God. Pentecost challenges us all not to strive to make others just like us, our words, our deeds, our theologies, our preaching styles, our way or the highway. No, I'm reminded of this by comedian Emo Phillips, who made this point very clear. And this is what he said. He said, I once saw this guy on a bridge about to jump. And I said, don't do it. And he said, nobody loves me. And I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? And he said, yes. I, and I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? And he said, a Christian. And I said, me too, Protestant or Catholic? And he said, Protestant. And I said, me too, what denomination? And he said, Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? <laughs> and he said, Northern Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? <laughs> and he said, Northern Conservative Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. <laughs> Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And I said, die, heretic. <laughs> and I pushed him over. When we attempt to make others into our image, and not affirm who and what they are in God. We kill the spirit. And maybe each other too. Rather than reveal the spirit of life and unity. And this is why the work of Howard Thurman is so important where he says, follow the grain in your wood. Your own idiom. Who you are. Uniformity means everyone looks the same acts the same, thinks the same, and is the same kind of Baptist <laughs> or person. And what uniformity really means is that we are just worshiping ourselves and not God whose beauty is embodied by multiplicity and diversity. Sameness is actually more problematic than diversity because the latter is a gift of God, whereas the former suggests we are in charge. I wanna share this story I, I wrote in my book, Becoming Human, about a British Airways flight. On a British Airways flight from Johannesburg, a, a middle-aged, well-off, white South African woman found herself sitting next to a black man. She called the cabin, cabin crew attendant over about her seating. What seems to be the problem, madam? Asked the attendant. Can't you see, she said. You sat me next to a kafir. I can't possibly sit next to this disgusting human. Find me another seat. Please calm down, madam, the stewardess replied. 
The flight is very full today, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go and check to see if we have any seats available in club or first class. The woman gave a snooty look or at the outraged black man beside her, not to mention at many of the surrounding passengers. A few minutes later, the stewardess returned with the good news, which she delivered to the lady who could not help but look at the people around her with a smug and self-satisfied grin. Madam, unfortunately, as I suspected, economy is full. I've spoken to the cabin services director and club is also full. However, we do have one seat in first class. Before the lady had a chance to answer, the stewardess continued, it is most extraordinary to make this kind of upgrade and I have had to get special permission from the captain. But given the circumstances, the captain felt that it is outrageous that someone be forced to sit next to such an obnoxious person. With that, she turned to the black man sitting next to the woman and said, so if you'd like to get your thing, sir, I have your seat ready for you. And at that point, many in the surrounding passengers stood and gave a standing ovation while the man walked up to the front of the plane. The celebration of diversity on that plane is the way of God. Without the other tongues, the other languages, the fire of the Spirit might be dimmer but with one another in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one realizes that the gospel travels across the world into every tribe and nation. The gift of this community is that it is indeed not a homogeneous unity, but a differentiated one. Pentecost is really about the unity of a diverse people, and we can only unify when we diversify, because there has to be diversity in order to have unity. Otherwise, all we have is uniformity, not unity. And the church is called to be unified, not uniform. We aren't the church when we are uniform. We are the church in the power of the spirit when we are unified, reflecting a unified diversity focused on God. And this unified diversity consisting of speakers, hearers, and God is the context for the gift of proclamation. And it is a gift that the fire does not destroy, but builds, creates, and invites us to a common hospitality, even if we possess different homiletical theologies and perspectives. So let me close with this. This constructive homiletical reading of the day of Pentecost has been a suggestive attempt to highlight some key aspects of the day of Pentecost as found in Acts in order to begin to explore their fruit for thinking about proclamation. Pentecost reveals that our speech is fundamentally grounded in a divine gift given by God, the Spirit. Therefore, we are not creators of breath, nor creators of the word. We are stewards of breath and of the word that has been received. Speech, understanding, community, and even God are a gift to be received. As preachers, we therefore stand in a posture of waiting for the gift of the word of God to come, just as it came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Thus, the future of preaching through a lens of Pentecost is actually the practice of prayer even as that soaked the setting of Pentecost, which you can see in chapter one. We pray for the gift because one does not know when the giver will give it. It may not come when you want it, but it will be on Kairos time. In fact, as I noted already, Howard Thurman wisely writes that the practice of spiritual disciplines does not guarantee that the spirit will be encountered. This suggests that preaching requires an epistemic humility and a hermeneutics of trust through the posture of prayer. Since speaking, understanding, and community are gifts of and in the spirit, we ought to be surprised many times, at least from a human standpoint, because as gift, one never knows when one will receive a word or when the word spirit will fall like fire. 
The pouring out of the Spirit or the descent of the Spirit is not a one-time event quarantined at the day of Pentecost. It is an ongoing, ever fresh, ever moving, ever re-articulating, never stagnant, never entombed in tradition movement of God. The Spirit is free to ignite, inspire, innovate, instigate, and interrogate. The Spirit is free, thus one might expect to be surprised by a holy breeze. And as we wait for the divine promise and the divine surprise, may we do as they did in the upper room and constantly devote ourselves to prayer, maybe even praying our own, help me, Holy Ghost, asking God to bless our fragile homiletical mess. In this way, we acknowledge preaching as one lifelong, loving epiclesis, an invocation calling on God as empty pitchers coming to a full fountain with no merits of our own. I'm suggesting, and I may be talking myself out of a job, that preachers ought to be better prayers than preachers. And before taking a text, they should take the time to pray. Remembering what George Herbert said in his poem, Church Porch. Resort to sermons, but to prayers most. Praying's the end of preaching. And praying will be the end of this lecture. Let us pray what Jesus taught his disciples saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.